grade 12 mindset as you're here with me and Aslam today for life sciences. We're going to be doing plants, hormones, and defense mechanisms, proudly sponsored by Macmillan. Thank you so much. So, and don't forget, please post all your comments and all the things that you want to know from Aslam and I on the Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash learn extra. Or if you want to get all the notes that you prepared and sitting there and like reading as Aslam's going, then you can also go onto the website at www.mindset.co.za forward slash learn extra. So I think it's time we get into the lesson. What do you think, Aslam? Yeah, we are ready to go. Okay, let's ready? rock. Rock and roll. I hope they warned you from the studio from behind, from mm? the behind the scenes that I ask a lot of questions. Do you are oh okay. So I'm prepared, okay. You're I'm gonna prepared. put my I'm gonna sit down so I know what's gonna happen there now. There you go. Welcome mindsetters. Remember last week we concluded with evolution and that brought us to the end of paper one as we know it. Remember paper one for version one. Right now the emails are coming to me to and fro and coming from one person and the other person. There's a whole lot of confusion whether there's going to be a version one and a version two or just a version one. As soon as we get conf confirmation on that, I would obviously pass that information to you. But right now we, remember here, are concentrating on the current program. That means those full-time learners who are writing the paper for, for the first time at the end of this year or those that wrote last year and are repeating this year as well. So in that sense, we have then come to the end of paper one, which comprised of, again, to remind you, DNA, RNA, protein synthesis, meiosis, genetics, and evolution. We ended with that last week. We now charter into new territory, and that is paper two. Paper two deals with responses to the environment. The first response we talk about is that of plants, and that's why we are talking about plant hormones and plant defense mechanisms. Thereafter, the brain, the spinal cord, the eye, the ear. Immediately after that, we go to the endocrine system and we look at animal hormones. Thereafter, we look at reproduction. I know you're waiting for that section with bated breath and lots of anxiety or rather excitement, I would say. And then we look at homeostasis, mainly the skin and temperature control, or big word, thermoregulation. And that brings us to the end of the human studies. And then we look at the population studies in the environment. How do we work out populations, etc. And lastly, we look at social ecology. How do organisms socialize in the environment? And that will bring us to the end of paper two. I've said a mouthful in terms of that. Let's go to what we have on hand, and that's today's work, and that's plant hormones and defense mechanisms. What are we going to look at today? First of all, we're going to look at the general functions of these three hormones. Auxins, gibberellins, watch the spelling, it gets me every now and then. It's double B and double L, not a double R. Gibberellins, gibberellins. Pronounce the words the way they're spelled, it'll make it easy for you to get the spelling right. And abscisic acid, a tongue twister there with an S and a C, and then another one S and another one C right at the end. Abscisic acid. And we then go on to specifically the role of auxins in geotropism through the regulation of differential growth, and we look at the role of auxins in phototropism. We then go further to say, look, we know these are the natural functions of these hormones, but how do we as humans use these properties and functions of hormones to help us? And we look at the use of plant hormones in agriculture, all of those, we're going to be discussing them, we're not going to go through all of them now, we'll talk about that later. Lastly, we look at this little topic right at the end, the role of the following as plant defense mechanisms. In other words, how do plants protect themselves? Yes. You don't believe us, Megan? On that. I believe you. The plants do they protect do. themselves. They we to. think we, you know, we're the main guys, the humans, we can do <laughs> all and be all. No, 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 no. Plants. They do a lot more than you and I can think about. We'll talk about that when we get there. And mainly we're looking at two areas, how they use chemicals to protect themselves and how do you use thorns. And by now, just by writing that down, you can speak a 
a whole page, or write a whole page rather, you can't speak a page, but you can write a whole page just on these two because of your own knowledge and your experience in these sections. Good guys, now that we know where we're going, let's get right to it. Let's start with, first of all, what are hormones? I know a joke about that, but we're not going to talk about that on national TV, right? What are they? First of all, and the most important thing that you have to understand about hormones is that they are messengers. And not just messengers, but chemical messengers. This is what hormones are. In other words, guys, these are chemicals that take messages from one place to another place. In other words, they're telling the organism's parts of its body what to do. Generally, they are secreted in one area and they act in another area. So they're secreted in one area and act in another area. And you've learned a few hormones in your studies in grade 11. One would be ADH in excretion. Another one would be, another two rather, insulin and glucagon in nutrition. We're going to look at that when you go into uh, animal hormones later as well. And you must have learned a little bit about hormones. Thirdly, they are required in small quantities. You don't need a lot of hormones to do the work. A little hormone does a lot of work. Just like a woman. Well, <laughs> I was going to say, and the women will know all about that. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's it, Megan. Keep me going there. That's what I like to hear. <laughs> Long term, slow effects. Now, we won't associate that with Men. women. Long term, that means it's not going to happen today. And it's not going to happen fast. It's going to take a while, and it's a long-term effect on that particular uh, part of the body. Plant hormones are not true hormones. Why? Because they act generally in the same area where they are produced. That means they are pr produced in certain areas, and as we're going to find out when we do the work just now, and they act in the same area. Generally, a property of the hormone is it's secreted in an area, for example, let's go back to your, uh, the, your knowledge, and your knowledge base would be that of insulin and glucagon secreted by the, you remember last year's work? The pancreas, that's right. The islets of Langerhans specialized cells in the pancreas secrete insulin and glucagon, but they do not work there. They secrete it directly into the blood, and they travel to the liver where they do what they have to do. So you see, secreted in one area and acting in another area. But don't stress if you don't know the story about insulin and glucagon right now, because we're going to revisit that whole story when we do the endocrine system. And as has been our habit for the last three to four weeks, we start off with questions which reveal answers which form the content of what we are learning. So in other words, we're trying to kill two birds with one stone, so to speak. What do we mean by that? We want to learn this work, but we don't want to learn it divorced of how it can be examined. So we want to look at it together. This is how the question is phrased, and this is the answer. And by the way, this answer is the content that you have to learn. So we're doing it together. So the first question there, and I know I've got to do that. Name the five main plant hormones. Remember, the curriculum specifies the three that I mentioned earlier. Those are oxins, gibberellins, and abscisic acids. But there are five known main hormones in plants, and we want to know their names here. And they are oxins, we spoke about. We spoke about gibberellins, double B, double L, we spoke about, we didn't speak about this one, cytokinins, it's a new, new one for you. Another one would be ethene, that should be ethene, ethene, with an E, or ethylene, and abscisic acid. I told you for our studies, we have to concentrate on that one, that one, and that one, in terms of their functioning. But in terms of their use, in agriculture, we have to look at all at the end again. So remember that. For their functions, you only need to know oxygen, gibberellins, abscisic acid. Further than that, you need to know geotropism, phototropism. 
and you need to know the industrial role of these five hormones in plants. Good. The next question says, tabulate the functions of the hormones prescribed in the curriculum. And those are, again, auxins, gibberellins, and abscisic acid. And they're, they're on the board there. We'll do one at a time. We can't, we're not going to go through the differences because they're not really differences. Remember, they didn't say tabulate the differences. They just said tabulate the functions. So the question is telling you, give the functions of these parts, uh, of these hormones, but put it in a form of a table. And you look at the mark allocation is 13 there in this particular case. All right? Let's see how we get 13 marks. Let's look at auxins first. First of all, one of the primary functions of auxins is that it stimulates cell division. In other words, it causes cells to divide to make more cells, mitosis. It also causes cells to become longer, cell elongation, which causes the stem to become longer. The development of fruit, straightforward, no explanation needed. It inhibits, now notice the word, we'll have to do a bit of explanation there. It inhibits the abscission of leaves and fruit. So there's two big words there, the abscission and inhibits. Inhibits, not to stimulate, to stop, to prevent, to reduce. Abscission, the falling of leaves and fruit. So auxins inhibits the falling of leaves and fruit. The development of adventitious root in stem cuttings. Now, if you have gone into a little bit of horticulture and you realize that when you want to transplant some rose trees, in other words, you have some rose trees and you want to make more rose trees from them, you simply do what we call a stem cutting. Now, you can't just cut the stem and dump it in the ground. Chances are it may get infected and it may not grow properly. So before you do all of that, you buy some synthetic auxin and you make a little solution of it. You take these stem cuttings and you leave them in that liquid. After a while, you'll notice some roots sprouting on and these are adventitious roots. Thereafter, you dig a little hole to put the stem in and from there, voila, there you come a new rose tree clone of the original rose tree that you had. Why clone? Because there was no sexual reproduction involved there. You simply took a cutting of the same parent plant, so the genotype of that plant will remain if it was having red roses. It couldn't still give you red roses, etc., etc., etc. Some genetics paper one coming back in what we are doing. Good. So that's another one there. The other one, which is we're going to study, tropic movements in stems and roots. We are going to explain what is tropism later, so we're not going to delve into that now. Then apical dominance which suppresses the growth of lateral buds. Again, apical dominance, we're going to cover a little bit later, so we're not going to go into that now. Next up is gibberellins, stem elongation, very similar there, cell division, so stem elongation there. Also, it stimulates root growth, straightforward, germination of seeds. In other words, gibberellins tells the seed it's time to germinate. Important message that is. And it promotes Flowering, budding, and fruit development. That's straightforward. Uh, Psychic acid, on the other hand, causes dormancy in apical and lateral buds in winter. This is important to the plant because the plant must not grow during winter. It's unnecessary to grow during that time because it means more parts will be exposed to the severe weather and this could cause the death of the plant. No good. So, abscisic acid tells you, hello, boss, stick around, don't grow now. Control seed dormancy by inhibiting germination. Again, seeds are dispersed by plants. They land somewhere. How do they know they must germinate? Abscisic acid, concentrations are high, the seed won't germinate. When the weather starts getting better and more favorable, abscisic acid's level will go down and the seed will germinate. Accelerate abscission in leaves and fruit. So this one now, this one here inhibited abscission. Abscisic acid accelerates abscission or falling of leaves and fruit. It's also produced in ripe fruit and it induced, 
induces fruit fall, the falling of fruit from the tree. It also stimulates the closing of stomata in most plant species. Now let's have a look at that. I'm just going to leave part of it there for you to have a look. And I think I have spoken a mouthful, Megan. Wow. <laughs> I'm just sitting here like this, like going, wow. And then people on the Facebook page are asking me questions. So I promise I'll get back to you on all your questions now on the page. Don't forget, quickly go for a break, stretch. I don't know, jump up and down like I did now, now, and I'm pretty sure when you come back, you'll feel a little bit more revised and like energized to come back and learn more here on our Life Sciences Grade 12s. I'll see you back in a jiffy, okay? Welcome back, Grade 12 Mindsetters. You are here on Mindset Learn Extra watching Life Sciences. Yes, I know lots of revision going on. But before we get back into it, there's something I have to remind you of. Because you're 18, I hope most of you are you're turning 18, there's at the Randberg Studios here in, in Johannesburg, we have auditions at 9, from 9 until 1 o'clock for Connections. It's this new show talking about teenage problems and issues that we're trying to introduce. So if you think you have what it takes and you want to come audition, please, please hit us up on our Facebook page, www.facebook.com forward slash learn extra with an X. And there's all the information about it posted on the page. So if you think you have what it takes, come come down, see what it's about. And even if, if you don't, and it's, it's a brand new experience. So I think we should get back into plant hormones, but I'm just reminding you so that you do know. Aslam, let's go. Thanks, Max. Right, guys. Remember when we ended, we ended with the functions of auxins, gibberellins, abscisic acid. And there we're scrolling through very slowly for you to try to remember that. I just want to go right down to the page. What we did here is we said there were 13 marks, and I said I'm going to explain that. What we did is we say any four functions, any four functions of each of them, that would give you four times three is 12, plus one mark for the table. Remember when you draw the table because it said tabulate, you're going to get one mark for the table. So that's the one mark, and then any four functions of each of these would give you. But remember, if it didn't say, this particular question didn't say tabulate four functions. It said tabulate the functions. So then they do not mark the first four. If they said four function of each, then the markers are instructed to mark the first four from each one. So you must be very sure when they give you a number like that, that the first four, if you want to write 104, it's fine. Make sure that your first four are the most correct in your mind. Because if you write 104, and the first hundred are all wrong, and the last four are correct, you're going to get zero because they mark the first four only in those cases. First four, first three, first two, whatever it is. When they ask you specifically for a specific number, in this case it was the function, so it's not too serious. So just thought I'd share that with you. We move on now to some definitions. This section, just like genetics and other sections, is full of definitions and terminology with which you should be familiar if you want to understand the concepts that follow. Remember, section A, questions 50 marks out of 150 in each paper is banging on terminology most of the way. So you need to know your terms. The first one here we're going to look at is tropism. Tropism. What does this mean? It means growth by a part of a plant in response to an external stimulus. Notice in this general definition of the word tropism, we do not specify the stimulus involved because it didn't say any tropism. It didn't add a word before the word tropism. All right? It, there was no, to be correct grammatically, there was no prefix to this word tropism here. So in that case, you keep the general explanation. The next one, as you can see, now we start adding prefixes. Phototropism. Photo, coming from light. So growth by a part of a plant, same first part, but now in response specifically to light stimulus. Why? Because they mentioned there photo before tropism. Then we move on to geotropism. Again, 
growth by a plant or part of a plant in response to gravity. Geo coming from gravity. Hydro, obviously, in response to water. Sigmo, in response to touch. Chemo, in, ter in response to chemicals. We are most interested in these three terms here. Tropism itself, phototropism, geotropism. Those are the three that we are interested in, in terms of the process. But you need to know these words as well. It can come in the one word answers. Good. So now that we know the terminology, let's spring right into the actual process of phototropism and geotropism as we know it. The first one we look at is phototropism. Again, photo light, and we're talking about bending movements or movements in response to light. In the first diagram, they're telling you that light is coming from the top. Or we could also say that light comes from all directions. The response would be very similar. We must understand that this hormone oxygen is made at the growing tip, the apical bud. When light is received from all sides or from the top, the oxygen is distributed evenly down the stem. And because of that, it causes equal growth on all sides. And because there's equal growth on all sides, the plant grows straight upwards. My green t-shirt will help to make me look like a plant. I'm not a vegetable, please. Right? You can hear me talking anyway. All right. Now, what if we change the scenario? If we expose this plant to light from one side only, a fancy word in life science for one side only is unilateral light. So when you hear this word unilateral, don't start stretching and think, what the hell is this? Unilateral, uni, one lateral side. So light from one side only. The theory goes that when a plant is exposed to light from one side, the oxygens move, are stimulated to move to the other side. Which other side? The dark side or the non-illuminated side. Or we can say the side that is not getting light. When a plant is exposed to unilateral light, light from one side only, the oxygens move to the other side. What is this other side, you ask? The side where there is no light, the side that's in the dark, the side that is non-illuminated, and that, in this case, would be here. So there's a lot of oxygens on this side. And remember, what is the role of oxygens? General, first I told you, cell division, cell elongation. So if there's lots of oxygens on this side and less oxygen on that side, there's going to be more growth on this side. So these cells are going to grow faster than the sides that are exposed to the light. And when this happens, the stem bends towards the light, moving towards the light. So we say that the stem is positively phototropic. Now, you're all at home, and this is not a very difficult concept to understand. I want you to locate your elbow. First of all, you must know where your elbow is. Let me show you. This is your elbow. Okay. Now, when you get to your elbow, if it's not too hard for you to get to your elbow and to identify what the elbow is, I want you to feel the skin on the outside of the elbow. Pull that a little bit. Yeah, pull that skin. All right? Now, I want you to pull the skin on the inside. Ah, you're having a hard time there, yeah? Why? Because there's less skin on the inside and more skin on the outside. With the result, what can we do? We can bend the arm inwards. We can't turn it the other way. Ask Steven Seagal in his movies, he'll do that to a couple of guys, and that's when you hear those funny <laughs> noise, clicking noise when the bones are going through the skin. We are not allowed to bend the skin that way, uh, sorry, the skin, the uh, bones that way, because the skin wouldn't allow it to stretch that way, besides the joint. We're not going to go into the joint now, but this way. So I'm only showing you this for you to remember that when oxygens are produced on that side more, they're going to stimulate growth, and if that side is Growing faster, it's going to bend the opposite direction towards the light. We say that the stem is positively phototropic. So simple sentences here. When a plant is exposed to light from one side only, first sentence, the oxygens move to the non-illuminated side, the dark side. 
second center. What do the organs do there? They stimulate cell division and cell elongation on this side. Which side? The dark side. So what happens because of that? They, these cells grow faster than the side that is exposed to the light. So what's so good about that? Because this side is growing faster, it bends more towards the light. And what's so good about that? We say that the stem is positively phototrophic. Notice my sentences are short and simple. Five or six sentences, keep it that way. Don't try to explain the whole process in one long, complicated, complex sentence. You yourself are going to get confused. Step by step, one sentence on a line and explain your answer. Try to remember the diagram. Okay, there's the diagram showing you what a stem would do if it's exposed to light from one side. There you go. The stem is in the darkness. Light is coming from that side. The stem automatically grows towards the light. Why is this important? The plant needs to grow towards the light to attract or to trap as much radiant energy as is possible for photosynthesis. This is why phototropism is important for the plant. Okay, here's another diagram showing you the plant leaning towards the sunlight. A little elaborate diagram there, but I thought I'll share that with you. Okay. The next question says, study the following diagrams and answer the question. Okay, there's a diagram. This whole apparatus is in complete darkness. So, there is no sunlight, there is no light at all. So, light has been excluded from this experiment. Obviously, if this was given to you in an exam, they would have to give you a little bit more information. But we are discussing it, so there's no need for more information. Why is the experiment carried out in darkness? I gave you the answer already, yeah? To exclude other variables, and in this case, to exclude light as being a variable. Otherwise, we can't prove what we want to prove here. And I'm not going to tell you what we're trying to prove here. We're going to answer that question. So what is the aim of this experiment? There's no light, so it can't be anything to do with phototropism. And the other thing you have to know is geotropism, to illustrate or demonstrate. Remember, we are not proving geotropism. We are not proving uh, uh, phototropism. It has been proven before already by experimenters before us. So we don't use the word to prove. We use the word illustrate or demonstrate. We are just demonstrating that this does happen. We know already that it happens. We just want to demonstrate it. Explain the results of the experiment. In other words, what do you see here? What can we see? We can see that the root is growing downwards, and the shoot is growing upwards. This is what we can see. They want you to, but they didn't say state what happens. Notice the, the language of life science. Did not say state what happens. They asked you to explain this result. That's important. Now let's explain the result for you. When the plant is placed sideways, the plant was placed horizontally, what happens? And it was in the dark, that you, you saw in the diagram. Gravity causes the auxins, let me get some pen there, gravity causes the auxins to accumulate on the lower side of the plant. Let's go back there quickly. So gravity is causing auxins to be here, on the lower side. Now, the trick here is, High concentrations of auxins in the lower part of the root inhibits or inhibits cell division. Now notice when we spoke about phototropism, we said that it stimulates cell division there. But in a root, a high concentration of auxins inhibits uh, cell division. And because of this, the upper part of the root now grows faster. So growth is inhibited here. It's stimulated on the top part. So what happens? Because these cells are growing faster than those ones, the root grows downwards. We say that the root is positively geotropic. We cannot talk about phototropic because no light was involved in this experiment. Right? That was the first part. The second part, high concentrations of auxins in the lower part of the stem, as we discussed earlier, when there's a high concentration of auxins in the stem, it stimulates cell division there. And this is where the confusion comes, people. You don't understand this concept. What is this concept? In a root, if there's too much, if there's a high concentration of auxins, it inhibits growth. In a stem, high concentration of auxins stimulates growth. Hormones have specific 
uh, actions on specific parts. So they can be different in how they work in different parts. So what happens? The cells on the lower part of the stem, where the oxygen is higher, grow faster, and the stem curves upwards. But normally when the stem curves, just now we said phototropism, but here there was no light, so you can't talk about photo. What happens here? The fact that the stem is bending upwards, it is bending away from gravity, and we are investigating gravity and geotropism, so we say that the stem is negatively geotropic. So if it goes towards the stimulus, it is positively for that stimulus. If it goes away, it's negatively. So the stem is moving up. This is a natural phenomenon in plants. With that, over to you, man. Me? Okay. Well, grade 12s. I know um, there's a little bit of technical difficulty with the notes. You guys all ask me about notes, 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 notes. But we are attending to the problem. If you have any questions, though, please, 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 please. Our Facebook page is so quiet. So it's... it's I just need someone to talk to, okay, because, like, as I'm sitting here, I don't know if you guys are understanding or what's going on, but quickly go have a break, and when we get back, we can have a great show, and then we can end it off, and that'll be it. Enjoy. Welcome back, grade 12s. You are here with me, Megan and Aslam, as we are discussing plant hormones as well as plant defense mechanisms. So I hear that you guys have actually answered what I said because I asked you to post comments and everything that you don't understand. So Aslam and I were looking at the break and we're actually going to discuss a few of the questions. So let me just get to some of them. And Sovo asks, auxin is responsible for the lengthening of the plant. Can you explain to me gibberellin promoting of the sprouting of buds that are dormant? So more. Yeah. So more, the question was you want to know is how do gibberellins there, uh, that word. <laughs> stimulate the sprouting, sprouting of, of buds, buds that are dormant? Yes. Gibberellins will then, when the gibberellins uh, levels go up, it informs the sprout that was dormant. What does dormant mean? That the sprout was not in budding. It was not coming out. Why? Because the conditions were not favorable. So when the conditions are favorable, gibberellin then is your messenger, chemical messenger, to tell the bud, the, 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 the bud, hello, it's time for you to sprout. That means the weather is better, uh, the, the conditions are better, and in other words, it takes the bud away from dormancy into activity. Dormancy means a period of inactivity. And moving away, sprouting, then that means the bud is now active and life for that plant continues. Perfect. I think you've answered him perfectly. Yeah. And the other one? And the other question is, let me just find it. Um, what are the advantages of a period of dormancy in seeds? Good. We, 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 both our questions dealing with dormancy. The, the question says, what is the advantages or what are the advantages of dormancy in seeds? Seed, you know what is seed? Dormancy, period of inactivity, that means the seed will not germinate. What's so good about this? Remember, the plants are unlike us. They don't have heaters mm. and the air cons yeah. and blankets and so <laughs> on. So when they're out there, they're out there. There's no shelter for them. So when the elements turn against them, they need to protect themselves. So, and remember, the seeds form during the favorable months, and they are dispersed towards the end of that whole cycle. When the fruit comes about, if you eat the fruit, you're going to throw the seeds. Or if the seed comes out naturally from the plant, the fruit falls on the floor, the uh, fruit gets uh, decomposed, and the seed gets into the ground. Now, that is normally towards the end, and it may be the colder months, where there's not so much water, it's very cold, and the conditions are not good for this plant to grow. So having dormancy in the seeds protects the plant against the uh, bad elements, so to speak, in the colder months or in the unfavorable uh, weather, etc., prevailing at a particular time. I'm hoping that answers your question. Yes, and affection says that you are going so fast that so she can't get through her notes, but that actually means that she's listening to what you're saying. Affection, so. darling. Affection, darling. That's a good name you have there. <laughs> I said to Megan earlier, I can't forget your name now. Affection. Good. I'll be affectionately 
call, talk to you about a little slower now. Remember, we've got to go through what we have to do. And remember, you still have the opportunity after the show, tomorrow, next week, to go back to the link, click on to the video, and you can watch it whenever you want to. And when you do that, you can even maybe, if you save it properly, you can even play it in slow-mo. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. All right, but for your sake, af affection, I'm going to just go through this very quickly. First of all, we place this plant sideways. We ask you to explain the result. What is this result? The root is growing downwards, the stem is growing upwards. So we didn't say, tell us what happens. We say, explain. How did this happen? So how does this happen? First statement, with the influence of gravity, all the oxygen settle down at the bottom. There. As we put that, when that happens, it has two separate effects on the two different parts. In the roots, a high concentration of oxygen inhibits growth. It stops, it slows growth. So therefore, in the root, the top side, if I want to call it Durban way, top side and all, that side is growing faster than the lower side. And because of that, the root grows downwards. We say that the root is positively geotropic. It grows in the direction of gravity. And why is this good? The root needs to go down into the ground to anchor the plant first. Secondly, it needs to go in search of water. So the further down sometimes it needs to go, the more water it may get. That's the advantages of geotropism. At the same time, in the stem, the reaction is slightly different. Why? Because in the stem, a high concentration of oxygen stimulates growth. So the stem grows faster at the bottom side now. The top side and all is growing slower now. And therefore, it bends upwards away from gravity. Got nothing to do with light, so you don't talk about light here. Away from gravity, so it's negatively geotropic. So that will explain the last part that we had to do the result, and I hope that gives affection some time to catch up on the story. Now, just to put this in bigger, uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a simpler perspective, look at these plants. You know, the one is looking at the other one and wondering what the hell is going on with you? How can you grow that way with your root in the sky? So, geotropism and phototropism helps the plant, gives it the message that the roots must grow down into the soil and the shoot must grow upwards in search of light. This is what geotropism and phototropism help the plant to do. Going further, a group of grade 12 learners, and we name them, we take the liberty of naming, naming them, Sabiha, Shasira, Samira, and Muhammad Megan. Those are all my children, by the way. <laughs> oh, okay. blackmailed me to keep their names on TV. They're all genius. Right? That's the only way they could get on I TV. I would have done that. <laughs> okay. So these kids set up an experiment where three groups of seeds are grown in a cardboard box, study the diagram, and answer the questions that follow. So there's our box there, nice box, and there's a hole on one side, so light is coming from one side only. There's the light coming in from the side. Now notice in this particular plant what these learners did, if you want to call them that. In the first plant, they cut the growing tip. In the second plant, they covered the growing tip with an aluminium cap. And the third plant, C, they left it normal. And what happened? What can we see? This one we see there's no growth. No growth. This one, growing straight up. And this one is bending towards the light. That's what we see. This is our observation. Notice the difference between a conclusion and observation. Observation or result, what do you see? What's happening? What do you smell in an experiment? What happened? What changed from X to Y? What happened? So what did you see? That's your observation. And that's what we have just described now. What happened? Now, they think, all right, then the, <laughs> I probably gave the answer away anyway. They say, describe the results shown in the diagram. And that's the first question. Describe. It just said, describe the results. Oh, no, explain. Describe. What did you see? Notice the, uh, the, the, the verb that is used. Describe. Oops. Uh, forget about that, describe, and the last question said, explain the result. So in explain, you've got to go further. Why did this result happen? Describe, what did you see? What changed? Okay. So in A, 
When the tips are removed, okay, A, I'm going to try and put this, all right, the easiest way to do that, no, we won't be able to do that. In A, the tips were covered or, or cut. When the tips are removed, the stems do not grow. That's all. Describe. What happened? The stems do not grow. Next one. When the tips are covered, all parts grow equally, so the stem grows straight upwards. Straight upwards. And in C, when the tips are normal, that means they're not cut, they are not covered, they grow towards the light source. In other words, they bend towards the light. You don't have to say why this happened or anything. You're just saying what you saw. What did you observe? So that's what you're saying there. Now the next question goes back to what I said earlier. Explain the results above. How did this happen? Why did this happen? And when the tips are removed, the tip, the growing tip is removed, there is no oxygen made. So the stems can't grow because there's no growth substance. Oxygen stimulates cell division. We cut the tip, there's no oxygen, so no growth. So we're giving an explanation. There's no oxygen, so no growth. The next one, when the tips are covered, oxygen moves to all parts of the uh, stem equally, so they grow. Because now the tip is not getting this light source. It thinks it's getting light from all sides. So it distributes oxygen evenly and therefore equal growth and therefore it grows straight up. Explanation. And the last one, when the tips are normal, oxygen is stimulated to go on the dark side, the side that is not getting light. And when that happens, it causes more growth on that side, on the shaded side, and the stem bends towards the light source. Notice the difference between describe the result and explain the result. Describe, you're just telling them what happened. Explain, you're saying, why did we get this result? So we're taking the results again, we're talking about them, but we're expanding on it. I've used these two words deliberately to highlight the differences between them. All right. Provide two conclusions. Remember I said earlier, observation is what you see. Conclusion, based on what you see or what you observe, what can you deduce from this? What general principle comes out of this, what we have discovered or what we have observed? Okay, this is do that. Good, okay, lucky. Undo. Undo is a, <laughs> an amazing tool. <laughs> if you do not know anything about the computer, learn first how to undo. undo. Mm -hmm. okay. Silo or says he likes your cartoon. That was at the bottom. Oh, the one at the bottom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Who is that? Silo. Silo, thank you. That's a nice cartoon. I like it myself. You can get it on the page. It's on the page. Share it with your teachers. Now, what are the conclusions can we make from here? Let's go back to pen. All right. Stems, first of all, are positively phototrophic. We could make that conclusion. Why? Because the stem is bending towards the light. What's the other conclusion can we make? And this is an important one because this ex the, the main conclusion here would be the second one. Why? Because, because of the three different scenarios we had, this proves this con we can make a conclusion from this that oxygen, which are pr responsible for growth and tropism, is produced at the apical bud. The minute we change the apical bud, we change the way the stem will grow towards the light. So we change its tropic behavior by messing with the tip. If we take the tip out, nothing happens, no growth because oxygen are removed. If we cover the tip, the tip doesn't know where the light is coming from, it thinks that uh, uh, from all directions, so it grows up. When we don't mess with the tip, then it knows where the light is coming from. Oxygen are pushed to the back, uh, or the dark side, not the back, sorry, the dark side, and growth is more, and we have phototropic movements there. Some diagrams to show various responsive responses of coleoptile. Here we have a coleoptile where light is given from one side only. We notice that bends towards the light. And what did they do? They, they covered this side here, and, uh, or rather lower down. It didn't affect the way the plant grew. That is a one thing there. And this was done by Darwin, Charles Darwin, by the way, your evolutionist uh, uh, scientist, and his son. 
not Erasmus and Charles, Charles and his son in 1880. They also looked at their Boyson and Jensen now 1913, the next century. Light from one side, the tip is removed, notice no growth. The tip is covered by opaque covered, that means going straight up. The tip is covered by a transparent cap. What's opaque and transparent? Some English. Opaque means that this light cannot pass through. Transparent allows the light to pass through. So in the first one, this guy doesn't know what's happening. It's like being blindfolded. You don't know what's going on. So it goes straight up. When we put it on a transparent cover, the light is still going from the one side, and therefore it bends towards the light. If we cover the base, then too it still grows there. What does this tell us? This tells us that the auxins are produced at the tip and not at the base. If we cover the base, it doesn't make any difference to it. When we cover the tip, it grows straight up. So this is what this type of experiment will tell us. To go further, uh, going further there, when we have light from one side and we, set, we cut the tip, but we put a gelatinous sheath between the tip and the rest of the thing, we notice that it still bends towards the light. That means the auxins can move through this gelatinous substance. Whereas if we separate the tip from its parts with mica, wood, or any steel substance, whatever solid, where diffusion cannot take place, then it will carry on to grow straight. Why? Because the auxins are not moving down the stem. We are now moving towards the end. Plant hormones in agriculture, how do we use these things in agriculture? First one we look at is auxin. Auxins are used as a selective weed killer, a herbicide. What happens here is the auxins stimulate growth in the weeds, and the weeds then outgrow themselves, competition, and they would then die because the resources are not enough for them. So there we have, that's the first part there. It also stimulates roots in cuttings, which we spoke about at length in our function. There, roots in auxins, I mean the stem cutting in, uh, in the culture of auxins, and therefore it will develop roots. It may improve the quality of fruit, example tomatoes, when sprayed with auxins, they have a better quality. Many fruit trees, example apples, pears, citrus trees, are sprayed with auxins to prevent abscission. We don't want the fruit to fall down. This is not a good thing because if it falls down, the fruit will get damaged. Rather, we want the farmer, he wants control, he wants to pick the fruit when he's ready, and therefore they spray it with oxen. Remember, these are all synthetic oxen. Farmers may use the property of apical dominance to make plants grow thicker. I said we're going to explain that. Apical dominance means that when the apical bud is there, and because oxen are produced there, oxen then prevent the, 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 the growth of lateral buds. So only the growing point grows. Why? This allows the plant to grow up as high as possible for life. It inhibits the side growing. Now watch what happens. Here's the growing point on the top. Here's the axillary buds there in this area. So in this case, they're not growing because it's an intact plant. If you go to this diagram, notice that the tip has been removed from here. What happens? The lateral branch starts growing. So when we take out the tip, the lateral branches can grow. So how does this help us? For example, you want to make a fence out of plants outside your house, which we call a hedge. What do we do? We cut the tip off. When we cut the tip off, the plant can grow sideways and therefore form a nice fence for you that way. So if we want the plant to grow thicker, we cut the tip off. If we don't want that, we leave the tip there and the plant will grow straight up. Gibberellins, if we spray grapes with gibberellins, they make them larger. And you can see, without gibberellins, with gibberellins. Also, spring also makes internodes of the plant bigger to provide more space for the individual grapes. This gives it more air, and more air prevents uh, pathogens from uh, infecting the plants as well. So giving them more space. Cytokinins, they slow down the aging process in some plants, the fruit and flower industry. So if the people in the nursery want to keep the flowers for longer, they spray it with cytokinins so they do not age while they're there. Also, when farmers are transporting fru fruit for a larger distance, they spray it with cytokinins so the fruit lasts longer. Uh, ethylene is another hormone. It promotes ripening of fruit, 
or 18. Now, bananas give off this hormone naturally. You'll notice at home, if you keep other fruit with bananas, now those fruit ripen quickly because the banana is giving out this hormone etin. And you thought plants couldn't talk. The one you took out from the tree is talking to the other plants. You buy avos at the moment, avos in season. You buy hard avos. You want them to get soft quickly. Put them with the bananas. They will soften very quickly. Try this, guys. And then you, think, then you can tell me whether I'm talking nonsense or not the next time we meet. Lastly, abscisic acid. Seeds are sprayed with abscisic acid to prevent germination in winter. So we don't want the seed to germinate in winter. We spray it with abscisic acid because it creates dormancy. So we're using the functions in a reverse way. Lastly, plant defense mechanism. Some are mechanical. Look at the coconut protecting the seed with a hard shell. And this plant, the rose tree, for example, has huge thorns so that the herbivores can't eat them. Uh, the, uh, the acacia tree also has uh, thorns. These plants here have spines. And there's an explanation there. A whole lot of explanations. I'm not going to go through the writing because I've given you the pictures. All right, chemical. Plants communicate chemically, as I said from the beginning here. They can signal other plants to prepare for an attack. Or they can attract insects that eat the other insect that's eating them. Amazing. These chemicals may act as poisons, repellents, or affect the herbivores. There can be uh, digestive problems and so on. Here's one where the caterpillar is eating here, but chemical released by the plant attracts a wasp. The wasp will eat the caterpillar, and in that way, the caterpillar will get, or the plant will get rid of the caterpillar. One quick question I think we can take. I don't know. I don't think we can take a question. OK, I can. If a coleoptile is stimulated by a light source from one side and responds by bending towards that light source, what is the receptor? The receptor is the cells that receive the light. The cells that receive the light are known as the receptors. What is the effector of the response? It's the auxins. The auxins bring about as a response. So the one that brings about the response is called an effector. And how is transmission between receptor and effector achieved? The auxins produced at the tip of the stem, they move downwards on the dark side, causing the cells to grow on that side. And if they grow on that side, the stem bends towards the light. And wow. That, I think, Megan? Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Mindsetters. Thank you for tuning in. We're so sorry about the technical difficulty. Difficulties, excuse me. A and day today. Yeah, we are so, so sorry, but they will be available for you sooner or later. I really hope so. Thank you for tuning in today's show with Aslam and myself. I'm sure I will see you at another time next week. And thank you, Macmillan, for proudly sponsoring our show. I'll see you, Mom, Dad, and Ryan at home. And thank you for tuning in. That's love from me to you. <laughs>